Hi, I'm Anastasia Marchenkova, and I've been researching in the quantum field for over 12 years now. I started my work in 2009 researching quantum telecommunication at Georgia Tech. We increased the coherence time, or the length of time that quantum information could be stored in neutral rubidium atoms, and we proved that quantum entanglement could actually be preserved when transitioning these photons to different wavelengths. Then I went to University of Maryland for my PhD, and I got really excited about quantum computing's move into industry. Since then, I've worked in two early-stage quantum computing companies using superconducting qubits. Now, I'm also a YouTuber who talks about quantum computing, with a vision of getting more people excited for and actually using quantum computing now that this has all moved beyond the lab. So, having been steeped in quantum computing industry for over a decade, I'm going to give you a quick Quantum 101, covering what makes a quantum computer quantum and the applications what quantum computers could maybe do better than classical computers. But even if Moore's Law keeps holding, there are many classes of problems classical computers just can't solve efficiently, no matter how large supercomputers get. For example, properties of atoms and molecules, necessary information for materials research, drug discovery, and more, can be found by solving the Schrodinger equation. However, the problem gets harder the more components and atoms you add. So exact calculations are hard above just a few atoms, and even approximate solutions are hard above a few dozen atoms. Instead, we build a new system of computing using quantum bits, or qubits, called quantum computing. Let's start by talking about qubits. In the traditional binary approach to computing, information is stored in bits that are represented logically by either a 0, off, or a 1, on. Quantum computers are based on quantum bits, or qubits, which exist in a probability or superposition of 0 and 1. And until you measure or observe it, you don't know which state it will collapse into. But that doesn't mean that we can just assign a regular bit a value of 1 half and call it a day. A qubit is a quantum system that can have two states, like a switch, but its special feature is that it can exist in a superposition of these states, meaning that it is in both states simultaneously. There are many possible ways to make a qubit. As long as you have something quantum that has two states you can control well, it can probably be a qubit. Everything from polarized light to specially prepared imperfections in diamond. Ion Q's qubits are stored in the spin of ionized atoms. They hold them still using specialized chips that produce electromagnetic force fields and then manipulate their spin with lasers. So we can take these qubits and build a quantum computer. A quantum computer is a system that uses the quantum properties of qubits, like superposition and entanglement, to perform computations. So not only does the qubit have to be quantum mechanical in nature, but we also need to be able to utilize these quantum mechanical properties to perform these calculations. Superposition means that instead of being in a 0 or 1 like your computer now, a quantum bit can hold a probability of being a 1 or 0. That means a qubit could be in any one of an infinite state. Entanglement is another fundamental quantum property we need to do quantum computation. When we say particles are entangled, it means that quantum states are linked to each other. The state of one cannot be described without the other, so they're not separable. This is a purely quantum phenomenon and that doesn't exist in the classical world. It's almost like information is spread across the particles. If you take two particles that are entangled with each other and measure any one of them, the state of the second one changes, even at a distance. These are non-classical correlations, meaning that quantum physics violates the laws of nature. Einstein actually didn't believe this, and he hated it. After all, it was inconvenient, disproving laws that we thought we knew about the world. Einstein incorrectly believed that quantum physics was predetermined, which would have made it more consistent with the world of classical computing. While entanglement stumped Einstein, today's physicists can leverage it to make quantum computers more powerful. We can prepare qubits with quantum information and entangle them. When we measure the outcome at the end, all the entangled states affect each other. A theoretically perfect quantum computer can handle two to the n states, a superposition of all n bit numbers, with n equaling the number of qubits. That means just 100 qubits can have the same computational power as about 10 to the 30 bits. If we look at this as just in terms of how much classical memory it would take to describe a quantum computer state, it becomes clear how powerful this is. Let's assume that each number is one byte. At n equals 30, 2 to the 30, or a gigabyte of memory is needed. At n equals 40, it's a terabyte. And at n equals 50, it's already a petabyte. And that's why, even though we can simulate small quantum systems, we can't really simulate large qubit systems. That's how quickly the power of a quantum computer scales. So how do we control quantum computers to actually simulate quantum states, or do optimization problems, or solve hard math problems like factorization? We use gates. 
Gates are the ways that we link bits together to perform logical operations. If you studied computer science, you might recognize some classical gates, like AND, NOT, and OR. These gates are the foundation of modern computing, and you can compute anything by simply performing a prescribed set of gate operation on bits. Quantum computers have their own set of gates that are very different from the set of classical computing gates, but serve a similar function as a basis for performing operations. For quantum computing, gates change the quantum state of the qubit. Quantum gates can operate on different number of qubits at the same time, producing unique effects, and in computation, this is particularly meaningful for universal gate quantum computers. Quantum computers where all qubits are connected to each other, because it means that there is a vast flexibility in how computations can be run. IonQ's quantum computers are one prominent example of this universal gate architecture. So now that we have our hardware and our gates, how do we actually apply these gates and write quantum algorithms? In traditional computer science terminology, an algorithm means a set of instructions. But when we talk about quantum algorithms, we mean instructions that actually harness these quantum properties of superposition and entanglement, and can potentially solve these mathematical problems much faster than a classical machine. Today, there are only a few dozen or so well-studied quantum algorithms, but we're really in the early days for quantum computing, with more being discovered every day. And even though there's a limited number of well-understood quantum algorithms today, the ones that we do know of can have a huge impact on very important problems. Take, for example, Shor's algorithm, which is often the first algorithm that people hear about when learning about quantum. Shor's algorithm, key to the future of cybersecurity, leverages the difference between how quantum and classical computers approach factoring numbers. Two of the world's most common crypto systems are RSA and elliptic curve cryptography. When you're online, any information that you exchange is encrypted, often with one or both of these. Both RSA and ECC are vulnerable to attacks by quantum computers. For example, RSA relies on the hard problem of factoring numbers. Multiplying two prime numbers together is easy, but taking a large number and factoring it to get those two prime numbers is very difficult. It would take longer than the age of the universe to factor one 4096-bit key with a classical computer. Shor's algorithm uses quantum properties to find the prime factors of the number and can undo this factoring problem much more easily than a classical computer. If executed properly at scale, it could entirely dismantle the basis of modern cryptography. And the algorithm was created in 1994. And Shor's is just one of dozens of quantum algorithms. Other algorithms, like Grover's algorithm, can speed up search on an unsorted database, which can be impactful as the amount of data we need to process grows. Grover's algorithm could be used for internet search companies, telecom data operations, and more. Algorithms like Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, or QAOA, and Quantum Unconstrained Binary Optimization, or QBO, can solve optimization problems like traveling salesmen, antenna placement problems, and graph coloring. These optimization problems quickly become classically intractable, or unable to be solved on classical systems, but have applications ranging from logistics to manufacturing and more. Additionally, algorithms like variational quantum eigensolvers, or VQE, have major impacts on quantum chemistry. Beyond quantum chemistry, the solution of these large eigenvalue problems could help us design new materials, such as discovering new materials that stand up to higher heat and strain for airplanes, so maybe we could fly faster or learn how to make more effective batteries. It's worth noting that quantum algorithms are not the solution to every problem. Some big misconceptions are that quantum computers work by trying every possibility at once, or that they can speed up every problem. That's not the case. Quantum algorithms are faster for a certain set of problems. But even though we only have dozens of quantum algorithms, the impact that they can have is huge, since optimization problems are really everywhere, and the differential between the quantum and classical algorithms is massive. Now, that sounds exciting. We are harnessing the quantum world, and we have all these quantum algorithms with big potential impacts. But when can we run large quantum algorithms on them and get out results that outstrip classical machines? And what's stopping us from making really big quantum computers right now? We are currently in the early days of quantum computing. Our chips have dozens or a few hundred physical qubits, but have high error rates, low coherence time, and may need a lot of error correction. Managing errors is really important in quantum systems because quantum states are delicate. Also, quantum information can only be stored for a short amount of time, called the coherence time. We need to apply all the gates and read out the data before the quantum bits decohere. Much of the focus in the quantum industry today is on increasing coherence times and decreasing error rates using error correction. Quantum error correction codes, some of which are hardware-specific, 
are a very active topic of research because they can allow us to actually harness more power from a quantum computer with fewer qubits. You'll hear more about IonQ's error correction tactics from the IonQ team today. Algorithms like VQE only need a handful of qubits to work and implement a shallow circuit. A shallow circuit means one that does not have a lot of sequential gates and therefore needs less error correction. A solution like Shor's algorithm, which includes complex circuits with many sequential gates, is considered a deep circuit. Solving Shor's algorithm would take something on the order of 4,000 error corrected qubits to break an RSA key, so rest assured that your internet data is still safe for the foreseeable future. But even as we're talking about qubit counts, the number of qubits isn't everything. It's just one way to understand how powerful quantum computing is, and maybe not even the most important one. Qubit counts don't mean anything if they're poorly constructed and are prone to errors. A few super reliable qubits with long coherence times where each one is directly connected to every other one is so much more valuable than hundreds of poorly connected, fast decoherent qubits with lots of noise. Now, with the power that quantum computers have, will they ever fully replace classical computers? Scientists disagree here. Right now, quantum computers have a small amount of qubits and are very expensive, so they're going to be used for specific problems where we see the most value. They won't replace classical machines today and will likely work in tandem with CPUs, just like GPUs and supercomputers do now. However, maybe in the future, if quantum computers become so cheap and so low noise, you may find yourself playing a video game using your quantum computer. It's not outside the realm of possibility. The future for quantum computing looks really bright. While a lot of the technology is still in the early stage, we do understand the fundamental physics behind quantum computing. We discovered the world of quantum physics 100 years ago. Now, a lot of work is going into exploring hardware implementations and processes, scaling, and understanding how to better control these quantum states. 